Hello everybody and welcome back to the channel. I've been actively imaging space using what's called traditional telescopes for quite some time now. There are also smart telescopes that seem to be really popular in the community, but I was kind of avoiding them. The first reason was having fully equipped setups, and the second I was a bit skeptical about the idea of having a smart telescope. Anyway, Dwarf Lab reached out and offered their Dwarf 3 smart telescope for me to try and see what I could do with it. Despite being skeptical about smart telescopes, I thought it would be mindless not to take and simply try it, and here we are after a full month of using it. Let's try to figure out if a smart telescope is a real deal or not. The Dwarf 3 is a compact, all-in-one smart telescope that has everything you need to take pictures of deep space. You have a telescope, camera, filters, computerized mount and a software that you can use to control everything. Dwarf 3 features two lenses. First is the 35mm aperture APA lens with a focal length of 150mm. The building camera has a Sony IMX678 sensor with 8.3 megapixels, capable of capturing through three different built-in filters. Visible filter for daylight imaging, astro filter for astrophotography in broadband, and duo band filter for narrowband imaging. The other lens of Dwarf is dedicated for wider views and mostly to help you to point telephoto lens to whatever area you need. The Dwarf 3 runs on a battery that lasts for about 5 to 6 hours of shooting depends on the usage and the ambient temperature. If you use the telescope for the whole night of imaging, you want to keep the telescope powered at all times. At least that was the case for me guys. Dwarf 3 is positioned as all-in-one smart telescope. It can handle solar, lunar, deep sky and terrestrial imaging and is priced at around 550 US dollars. The telescope has a lot of features that are dedicated to making the process of imaging as easy as possible and let's dive into my experience using it over the past months. I'll break it down by areas of astrophotography this telescope is capable of doing. First, let's start with deep sky astrophotography. You can do imaging in two modes. You can either keep the telescope in alpha azimuth mode or you can polar align the telescope to enable the AQ mode. While doing astrophotography in alpha azimuth mode does not require much from you in, except like uh, placing the telescope outside and powering it up, I really want to encourage you to use the AQ mode whenever it's possible. Yes, you still can get nice images in alpha azimuth mode, but you also get field rotation in long exposures, which affect your imaging over time, especially if you collect hours of degradation time. All you end up with is the only clear image in the center of the frame with more noisy corners that some processing software simply cuts from the frame, making your overall field of view smaller. Luckily, the app guides you through the process of polar alignment super easily and if you're a complete beginner, I think you'll nail this process after a couple of times doing it. The Dwarf app has an internal atlas where you get to choose what target you want to image. You can either search by the object name, make your favorite one or even type your own coordinates. Preparing your imaging sequence is also pretty straightforward. You can either set up imaging of one target at a time, or what I've been doing lately is to use the schedule mode where you can plan your imaging sessions for the whole night in advance and capture more than one target using different exposures or filters without supervising the telescope. When doing imaging, you can either view one exposure at a time or look at the live stacked image that improves over time as you capture more exposures. For image processing, the app has built-in tools that do a decent job stacking and post-processing your images, but I personally prefer downloading the raw files to my computer, stacking them in software like DeepSkyStacker or PixInsight and post-processing them on my own. I feel like having like, a bit more control over the image and I believe I'm getting much better results when processing images myself rather than using the internal software. If you guys want me to share how I process the dwarf images, then let me just know in the comments below and I either will do a separate video about it or we can also do a live stream. Talking about the quality of images, I must say that I'm quite happy with the results I got considering the small aperture of the dwarf telescope and a sensor that is more dedicated for planetary imaging when using regular telescopes rather than with this one. Yes, you might not get the best shot if you collect like a half an hour exposure time or so, but this telescope fully uncovers its potential once you collect hours of integration time and especially when you use the AQ mode. Talking about the length of the sub-exposures, I would mostly go with either 10 to 15 second sub-exposures in alt azimuth mode, and when I switch the telescope to the equatorial mode, I would either go with 
30 seconds of exposures or a minute. Also, after one of the latest updates, you can go with up to 2 minutes of exposures in equatorial mode, but I personally haven't tested this feature yet, just simply because we have clouds. But anyway, as soon as we have clear skies, I'm really looking forward to testing 2 minutes of exposures on the Dwarf 3, and uh, this part will be in my next video, guys. Also, I want to briefly show you a couple of examples of a single exposures that you can get with a telescope. And here we got Southern region with some uh, hints of a butterfly nebula lying over here. And this is how stars look like on the image. They appear to be pretty sharp, in my opinion. That's uh, just one minute exposure. But what I want to show you guys is that a couple of your first sub-exposures, they're not gonna look good. So for example, here is the first exposure that I got on a sequence. As you can see, we have star trails. Second exposure was a bit better in terms of stars. And what I believe is that Dwarf needs a couple of minutes to kind of set up its tracking rate more accurately. And that's uh, something that I noticed on the Nomad Star Tracker, for example. That was exactly the same thing. A couple of my first exposures on the higher focal lengths, they were kind of tracked, but then tracker was working well. Kind of same idea, I believe, works with the dwarf telescope. And uh, occasionally during the night, uh, you might see that some of the subframes might have some tracks, which is um, kind of okay, I guess, considering that the mount does its job without guiding and it's just basic tracking. Now I want to briefly show you the comparison of single exposures versus stacked images. So here we got 60 second sub exposure of the southern region. As you see, yes, we only have kind of a hints of the butterfly nebula and overall the image is pretty noisy. And by the way, the night I was shooting this uh, target at was really hot and humid. That's why uh, we kind of see a lot of noise on this image. And here we got the stacked image where we have almost five hours of integration time. As you see, the image looks much cleaner in terms of details, in terms of noise. And uh, here I only use darks as my calibration frames. Uh, talking about star shapes overall, that looks okay, but if you like pixel peeping, you might find some of the stars, they're not perfectly round, and uh, it's totally up to you guys if uh, it concerns you or not. And here, just to briefly show you, this is how the processed image looks like. As you can see, I fixed like all the star shapes, they'll appear to be smaller than on this frame. Uh, the details of the nebula also look pretty good, and... Uh, this is just, yep, as I said, a bit less than 5 hours of shooting. Now let's briefly look at M31 Galaxy. This is 30 seconds of exposure and here we got a stacked image. I believe here we got like 2 hours worth of integration time. On 30 second exposures, stars, they appear to be looking much better than I had on my 60 second exposures. Maybe it was polar element or something, but anyway, this is how the image looks like. And this is really interesting part, that's what I want to show you. So here I got the picture single exposure of M7 star cluster. And this one is a stacked image. So what's interesting about this one is that I was using Althazimut mode of the telescope, where I basically was not able to do polar alignment as I was capturing from the balcony. And I did not have a clear view of the Polaris. So this is what Pixinside did in stacking. As you see here we got the full exposure, but since we got field rotation, then Pixinside cropped kind of this part of like whatever images it had and only concentrated on whatever the good signal to noise ratio it had. So basically this is guys something that you might want to consider when you're getting images in alt azimuth mode and if you do it over the long period of time. So here for example I had I believe like an hour and 30 minutes worth of integration time then the corners of the image, they will be much noisier. And for example, the Dwarf software kind of works around a bit and uh, um, does not crop as much as Pixinside did, but still it's something that you want to consider. And if you have an opportunity to do polar alignment, then please do. And there is nothing to crop basically on the images. As you can see, this picture of the Andromeda I got when polar aligned the telescope. And uh, this is the single exposure. This is the stacked image. So here we got 15 seconds of exposure on the Ptolemy cluster, and here is a stacked image. The difference, I believe, is crucial, and uh, yes, guys, this is something for you to consider as well. Now, let's briefly cover a couple of things that I did not like about deep sky imaging with Dwarf 3. So first is when framing a target in the Apps Atlas, the software automatically centers the field of view to the closest known objects, so it's hard to choose the framing you want when picking the target sometimes in the atlas, and the only way to go around it is manually picking the coordinates of the center of the frame, which 
kind of basically an extra step that could be avoided. Second, the dwarf can automatically take dark frames, which is good, and you need them to improve the quality of your stacked image by reducing noise um, of your basically light frames. And um, the only concern here that I have is that dwarf thought it's a good idea to capture dark frames right at the beginning of your imaging session. At least I don't quite get an idea of wasting your imaging time taking dark frames at the beginning. And uh, in addition, the telescope sensor does not have a cooler, so the temperature changes throughout the night anyway, making pre-imaging darks kind of less effective. Meanwhile, it's also nice that Dwarf gives you the information about the temperature of your light and your dark frames, and uh, if needed, you can just retake your dark frames at any time that you want to make it uh, as close as possible in terms of the temperature of your light frames. The other thing I found was not a user-friendly interface in some parts of the app. So for example, when you choose the amount of sub-exposures you want to take, you can only use a slider in the app, which was a bit of annoying. And same applies for picking the time frame of your imaging targets in the schedule mode. It would be much better to have an option to manually type in all the parameters that you need without using sliders, and I hope the Dwarf Lab will do it eventually, as it's pretty kind of simple fix in my opinion. And here is actually another thing that concerns me with the dwarf a bit. So we're looking at the single exposure of the Andromeda Galaxy, 30 second sub-exposure. This image was actually calibrated and registered with all these images that you see on the right. I'm gonna start blinking the images and you'll see my concern. So as you can see, some of the subframes they jump up and down, left and right, really by a huge amount in my opinion. And uh, what I thought is that it's kind of integrated dithering in imaging, where basically if you really want to dither your images, if you take long exposures in order to eliminate all the patterns of the noise of the camera sensor and make the image cleaner. But guys, like I believe in some parts, the image jumps by a huge amount. I don't know if this is something that could be fixed via software. And it's kind of possibly makes sense if you take images in alt azimuth mode, where you kind of jump things around and compensate for the field of rotation, but in EQ mode, this is something that could be adjusted, I think. But yeah, this is something that I wanted to show you guys, and let me know in the comments what you think about it. Now, let's move to the next area of astrophotography with Dwarf 3, which is solar imaging. I haven't used it much yet, but from what I've seen, it's kind of nice for absorbing sunspots and tracking their shift on a daily basis. Dwarf Lab supplies the telescope with a magnet design solar filter that kind of looks really cool like a solar glasses, and the whole process of imaging of the sun is pretty easy. The same applies for lunar imaging. It's fine to observe the moon's phases and the craters, but guys don't expect a huge amount of details on the lunar surface. Overall, if you use the Dwarf for anything else rather than deep sky photography, it's more than like casual observations and sharing some moon or solar views with your friends. Although it's still possible to get nice images of the moon, for example, and uh, on the internet I've seen some of the like really nice images of the moon and the planet shine visible. And even I tried uh, to take a shot of the planet shine myself, and that was a bit tough actually, as the moon was kind of really getting close to the full face, but still it's possible to do it. For daytime photography, I haven't tried the telescope much, but it's a nice bonus if you enjoy nature shots. Dwarf Lab also sent me uh, this mini tripod together with the telescope, and I've used Dwarf 3 with the mini tripod a couple of times, and overall the tripod performs well. The only two downsides I noticed is the short length of the tripod and its price. The tripod is pretty short, with maximum height of 21 inches, I believe, which might not be enough in some cases, and the price for the tripod is 89 US dollars. So while the price could be reasonable since the tripod has a really nice built-in quality, uh, it has a hydraulic head and uh, you can do polarizing really precise, the tripod keeps the dwarf tree really stable at all times, so kind of no, no concerns on this part. I still kind of believe that instead of spending $89 on a mini tripod, you can get just a regular camera tripod. So for example, uh, over here I got this tripod that I've used with Dwarf 3 more often compared to mini tripod. And this one I got on Amazon for just a bit less than 50 US dollars. So guys, it's totally up to you. On the other hand, uh, I believe that this mini tripod that's the reason it's called mini, so it's really nice and you can easily uh, put it in your backpack. So for example, if you're traveling a lot and if you're concerned about the amount of weight that you get either on a plane or anywhere uh, you go to travel, then mini tripod could be an option for you. But if you're more like me guys, you setting up your telescope either on the backyard or on the driveway, then I would personally save money and go with just regular camera tripod. So what are my overall thoughts on Dwarf 3? 
This telescope has definitely surprised me in deep sky imaging and if you think about getting into astrophotography, want to make things as simple as possible and do not want to break the bank, then I think Dwarf Tree delivers a really nice quality for the money. And that's all despite uh, all the flaws that I mentioned. Especially some of them can be easily resolved in future software updates. Talking about other ways you can use Dwarf, I would consider it as a bonus. Dwarf 3 tries to do a bit of everything, but I believe it definitely succeeds in deep sky imaging. Honestly, I expected less from this telescope and possibly that's why I'm so happy with the deep sky work I did on it, considering the price of course and the amount of effort I had to put in. And spoiler, there was almost no efforts compared to traditional setups. If your budget allows, I definitely consider this telescope for kids as a present for whatever occasion you want. It will spark their interest in space exploration, which is a good investment in the future. This is also actually a good telescope for astrophotographers that happen to be traveling a lot. You can easily put the telescope in a backpack and take it anywhere in the world. Alright guys, that was my take on the Dwarf 3 Smart Telescope. If you have any questions, want to share your experience with smart telescopes or mention something that I missed, drop them in the comment section below. Thank you so much Dwarf Lab for sending this one over. I'll definitely continue my photography with Dwarf 3 as there are still a couple of things I wanted to try, such as the mosaic mode for example, and I'll be definitely using this telescope for some long exposure time projects where I'm planning to collect tens of hours of integration time on different targets. And of course guys, I would like to thank you for watching this video. I really hope this review was useful to you and I really hope to see you in my next videos guys. But until next time, clear skies.